Yeah, so welcome everyone to my BOF about open source fleet and device management. <coughs> so some people are still coming in, but I think we'll get started. Yeah, a uh, quick slide about me. I'm Jan Lübbe. Um, I'm the CTO of uh, Pingotronics and uh, I'm the co-maintainer of the ROG update system. Maybe some of you heard Enrico's talk just uh, in the last slot and uh, LabGrid, the uh, testing or automation framework. And you can t contact me at, uh, via email or via Twitter. So, Quick slide about uh, what I understand at the, under device management and fleet management. So it's a bit dif different things. So the device management side focuses on the individual device. Each device should have some sort of identity to be identifiable in the um, management system. We need to have some sort of communication with this backend, usually encrypted, authenticated via TLS or something like that. We want to have monitoring, debugging of individual devices. So you want to log in, maybe if authenticated or allowed by the user on site. And uh, connected with the rest of the system, you have some sort of life cycle. So you provision the, the device and the credentials with the backend system. And then you have it in production. It's monitored and managed. And at the end of that uh, life cycle, it's um, removed and the data needs to be discarded. And you often want to have a secure tunnel to the device to yeah, provision or allow for all the rest of the features. And on the other side, the server side, you have uh, the fleet management, where you look at multiple devices or, or all of your devices in aggregate, and you want to run scheduled updates on that to yeah, detect problems with uh, updates early. So you don't break all of, your, all of your devices. You want to have some sort of alerting and some integration with other services. So for example, you have a monitoring service or data is um, aggregated in some different service, maybe a third party um, server where data is pushed over MQTT or some other protocol and that should usually be configured in a central place or per group of device, the devices. And of course, you need to authenticate the users of your fleet management and the devices as well. So my main motivation for this buff is to yeah, collect information because uh, I haven't found uh, such a device management or fleet management solution, which is a real open source or uh, healthy open source project yet. So I'm hoping to get a lot of feedback and discussion here to see if something like this exists or what the experiences are or if we need to coordinate to build something like this. So um, we have a, a Google Docs document, which uh, you can find there, and we're going to be able to edit this together. Chris is uh, taking some notes there, and we also use that to yeah, suggest to topics and vote on that, so I'm just showing that uh, here. So the link is also in the... Uh, OSS get, so you can just go there and yeah, suggest topics there, add small rockets as voting tokens, and we are trying to go through the um, topics with the most rockets first. So maybe to get things started, um, Is there a yeah, sure. Can we go back to the presentation slide? Oh, that slide. This one, can you? Yeah, okay, fine. So um, this fleet management is composed of multiple aspects, right? And the thing is, you may find solutions, boss, whatever, for each and every aspect. But w what you are after here, if I get it right, is some integrated thing. Not necessarily. So okay. um, because my requirements might be different from your requirements, it, I prefer something that could be built from separate components depending on what, what the needs are. So yeah. maybe someone wants to use MQTT as a, a message broker in the middle. Maybe someone wants to use something else. Yeah. And ideally, 
this should not be decided one by one big project because uh, yeah, that right. would mean then the I couldn't use the becomes hard, right? Because if you have multiple components to choose from for each and every aspect, you have to somehow integrate them into some fleet management form, which means you have to abstract the individual components, very abstractly speaking, um, have them satisfy an interface for which you then make an upper a global abstraction layer. So this is about integrating stuff that's already there, integrating the verticals into one thing that is maybe able to work with different types of the verticals. For example, take Hawkbit, take another one, take a proprietary one, all satisfy one interface and this interface you use and put your integrated fleet management on top, which means you have to um, <laughs> somehow bring the zoo of projects for the verticals together under one roof. And this is hard. Yeah, ob obviously it's a hard problem. So. Okay, we are on the same page. <laughs> so, so I'm not looking to, to have some ready-made thing, but ju just to get a better overview of what is out there, what is already solving some of these problems in a, in a good way. Yeah. What, what could be integrated uh, with other components which solve other things well. So um, at Pangotronics we are usually not, uh, we, we are integrating things yeah. and it's often project specific how they are integrated. But I'd like to avoid inventing all of these components again. Exactly right. And then you have to think about such stuff, um, for example, coming from AWS as a solution, right, which you can just buy. Maybe it's not perfect, maybe it's not complete, but you can buy this. Um, so the question is, even if you have all these components as free and open source software and have these integrations, yeah, um, who runs this and where? So you do have costs for operation. And if you just buy this from, from Amazon, AWS, you buy it, you have it, and they operate it for you on their premises. So this is not just the, the, the aspects of the um, technical side of things on the fleet management, but also the operational side. And there it becomes interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we thought about this as well for a longer time already. So this is why I'm asking such. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a wide topic. And yeah. so I'm looking for this yeah. as well, haven't found it. Um, yeah, so. This is a form where we can exchange our experiences with that. So maybe you try some things which others haven't and can give some recommendations or recommendations against specific projects. So yeah, I, I looked uh, on GitHub. So there are some uh, free and open source projects which cover part of these. I've looked at them but didn't really have time to, to try any of them in a real project. So. If I, maybe a show of hands, who has tried or used any of these yet? So uh, three, four, four people. So maybe give some some experiences. Okay, so I, yeah, obviously you are biased because you are my leader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah, we are biased, uh, as I said, because we are men there. But uh, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, uh, yeah, this one. So, uh, uh, yeah, so does anyone know what men there is or who we are? So, uh, yeah, we uh, traditionally started with uh, uh, yeah, device management or uh, updating mechanism for devices. But uh, we moved uh, very much into fleet management. So uh, scheduled updates uh, we have at the moment. Uh, we have a monitoring plugin which uh, helps with uh, alerting integrations. Uh, this is uh, covered uh, as well. And uh, user device authentication. So this is like device authentication is a prerequisite to like uh, authenticate, authenticate device to the server. And uh, user obviously is uh, covered as well. So we have uh, multiple options yeah. to authenticate users. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot more to be done here. So I'm not claiming that uh, Mender is perfect solution, but uh, a lot of those uh, those things by providing integrated client and server uh, solution, we can actually cover at the moment. And uh, yeah, as you have on the last slide, so uh, 
Uh, yeah, to be open and honest, uh, man, there is, uh, so uh, you have uh, 71 uh, GitHub stars, but uh, yeah, for the managed server, so we have, uh, I don't know, like uh, 80 different uh, repositories. Uh, Mender client is probably like, uh, I don't know, yeah, 800, 800 stars, yeah. uh, something like that. So uh, yeah, uh, this might be a little bit misleading, but uh, yeah, it's true that it's not fully open source solution, it's open core solution. So uh, some components are not uh, open source, like uh, Delta updates, for example, or uh, this uh, monitoring plugin that uh, I've been mentioning, but uh, both client and server is uh, fully open source. So, uh, yes, so w would you be um, merging pull requests, adding features that are currently um, closed source? <laughs> would we? So, so I if I needed a feature that is currently a, a paid feature, yeah. and I added that there's a pull request to uh, the Mender stuff, would you merge that? Uh, yeah, likely we would, okay. actually. So uh, the thing is, uh, uh, yeah, so we are a services company, right? Uh, so uh, we are product company. So uh, we need to leave off something, and that's why we have this uh, open core model. So we have uh, some uh, enterprise uh, extensions on, on top of it. But it's, uh, it's not uh, enterprise that because we want to... Uh, I don't know, like stop uh, development from uh, community. So if uh, there is a, an interest and uh, there is some alternative solution that uh, I don't know, community will contribute, then uh, part of the project is open source. And uh, we uh, we really want to develop the, the open source part as the, the open source. So we are contributing to other projects like Yoko, okay. for example. Uh, and then uh, we let other people to contribute to, to Mender. So it's not that uh, we will jeopardize the efforts to get to what we, uh, I don't know, like use as, uh, as enterprise, for example, add-ons. It's just uh, we made at some point a decision that uh, some part we need to close in order to, to make money. Yeah, so, so, so it would be necessary to maintain a fork of the Mender uh, server parts. No, not so. Uh, I mean, we will maintain the for, or we will ac accept the contributions to to Mender uh, server and Mender client as long as it uh, makes sense. The same way we would accept probably uh, contributions to Rogue as long as it uh, makes sense. So probably something that doesn't mm -hmm. make sense, you or no, maybe you'll make a decision that or no, you don't want this change to to happen. So it's the same. Concept. So in Rock, we, d we don't have any um, yeah, commercial features. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, th yeah. that's why it's a little bit different and I understand yeah. the, the concern, but uh, yeah, it won't be like uh, if there is a community interest in adding some uh, functionality to Mender, then uh, that will happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's very fair. Yeah. Okay, so maybe someone else who tried one of those uh, who is not a developer of <laughs> uh. it's, it's also about Mender, I must say. Um, so we had the problem that we need a, a solution relatively quickly, and uh, then I went through the different variants, and uh, Mender was a relatively complete solution for an over-the-air update, so something that I can also show to the management. Hey, look at this. It works like this. And in the meantime, I've also used the configure add-on and uh, together with Ansible, uh, so not that I execute Ansible on the server, but I execute Ansible locally, so rather in the pull mode. Uh, this is still on the stage of kind of a prototype, uh, what I showed yesterday. Um, but we have used in a in a less smart way already at at scale. So I'm pretty convinced that's going to work out. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so me with Mender as well. I brought in the S, uh, the Hawkbit support into SW Update and then tried a bit with Mender server in order to hook it up to SW Update as well. But um, it was playing with the Mender server as a replacement or an alternative to Hawkbit, not with the other stuff around in the Mender. Okay. Universe. Anyone else or should we go to the next part? Probably. So I looked a bit around uh, for the commercial platforms 
and uh, then notice that, for example, the Google IoT core stuff is uh, deprecated and will be shut down soon. So um, even if you go to the one of the very big uh, providers, you're not really safe uh, in yeah, relying on that platform. And yeah, the people who use that will move or will need to migrate to something else that is probably going to be difficult. So um, yeah. It's an uh, aspect you need to think about whether to build something on a service which might go away, especially if you build the product that have to be maintained for 10 or 15 years. So um, having something that could be uh, run on your own servers without migration is, is very relevant in, in some uh, projects. So experience with one of them or more of them from the room. Uh, no, not experience with one of them, but I think one is missing in the this foundries IO. Okay. Um, which is actually kind of open source. I, as far as I understand, they just don't uh, publish their server components because it's <laughs> my yeah, the, the, the client is open source, yes. My interpretation is that it's uh, stuff they hack together and it's not really ready for publication and that's why. But they, they document which components they use, so it's... Um, so, so you could build a replacement. You could build a replacement with probably substantial effort. <laughs> so no users of AWS or Asia or something like that here? I would have expected many more. Yeah, so um, we have had a close look at the Azure IoT Hub and especially the Azure Device Update Agent, uh, but it's not generally released at all. So, and it's still kind of, if you also look at the history of the commits on Git, it looks like an open source project, but they just drop in huge commits uh, and it, it's not open at all. So it looks great, but, um, but if you look behind the scene, it doesn't look good. There are a lot of variants that uh, were there, but many uh, were not even on, on, the, on the slide here. So we, for instance, also had experience with GE Predix. Uh, but what we also noticed that, for instance, the AB update or, or anything similar is not understood by many of those platforms. So they focused on the kind of shiny thing where you can put some boxes together and uh, do some fancy stuff. But uh, the, the kind of heavy lifting of the IB update is not understood by those platforms. The back-end part or the front-end part? Uh, the the back-end and the front-end part. So I was uh, quite surprised that many of those solutions out there really just can update something like APT packages or... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I didn't look close enough, but uh, yeah. So uh, Mender again, uh, yeah. So uh, we we talk about this uh, aspect of uh, yeah making money. Maybe we we are focusing on open source uh, things right now, but uh, the cloud platforms we we've been investigating a lot and. Uh, uh, to a large extent, it boils down to the same thing. So they maybe will go into the fleet management uh, solutions, but uh, they have no use of uh, device management thing because this is not where their revenue comes from, right? So uh, that's why probably the, the solutions are pretty, uh, or not uh, heavily developed. So uh, as long as uh, there is something that, something that can cover the gap of uh, devices being updated, Maybe the the cloud vendors will uh, will look into fleet management and then extra services uh, that uh, they can utilize because this is what they are doing, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, that's why I'm not that surprised uh, that uh, a lot of people don't have experience okay. with uh, those cloud uh, uh, solutions because the the device part that it's a prerequisite to do fleet management is not uh, uh, yeah developed very well. Yeah, okay. Sounds uh, interesting. So I think uh, we'll look at this. So. Hmm? 
So I just want to mention that they may have different focuses. So for example, the Bellina stuff kind of uses a core minimal system uh, and then has like Ubuntu core or something, um, stuff on top of it stacked on this. And they are more concerned about updating and maintaining the upper parts, while yeah. not the lower parts. So this may not be compatible to the typical Linux consulting work you do and we do. And maybe as a side note, you missed, of course, as I'm from Siemens, the Siemens Mindsphere. <laughs> <laughs> so we well, just add that to the notes and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so Balina is uh, yeah, more focused on updating containers, so it's a solution for part of the problem, but it's probably not easily combinable with stuff we usually use. Yes, okay, yeah. Okay, so we have two votes for um, what would be useful as standalone components. So uh, we, we like combining separate things. So for example, you have a MQTT server, maybe you go to Amazon and uh, rent that as a service, or maybe you host it yourself, but it's a standardized protocol where, for example, uh, a client or agent on the device could talk MQTT to your central broker and some other components to, could talk from the backend side to that broker as well, so that could be some mechanism to yeah, combine parts of the solution. Yes. So. <laughs> uh, yes, to a part, um, but what you want to have as a sustainable project or for example, some sustainable selection of components you combine is then more than just one set because this is again specific to a use case. Um, this you can do already. You can look around and take this and that, combine it, be done with it. Next time, next project, you may choose differently. Yeah. But this is not sustainable. This is custom engineering per project. Do you have suggestions for some components which are already out there and work well? Some, yeah, but uh, still, they are not, not generic. They are chosen per project, per application. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still look, looking for, for those uh, in individual components which work well because it's also useful to look at them for to, to see what the use cases are, uh, what works, what, what doesn't work before. So for the update case, you have uh, Hawkbit, which lost kind of traction a bit because the latest commits, the real commits are I think one and a half years ago or something. They are in maintenance mode, I guess. Yeah. Haven't talked to them for a while, but still, I guess they are maintenance mode. Then you have, of course, Vendor as a backend. Um, and that's about it in the open source world as far as I know. Apart from, from some very simple things like the um, generic HTTP server module in SW update, you may have seen this, um, a very simple thing. Um, that's about it as of now in mm. the open source world. We are going to work on something. I may not disclose this, but still this may add to the list. Um, so then we are for real update backends at three. Two open source, one open core. That's not much to choose from. Yeah. And this is for, for the female update backends. Then they serve different concerns. So for example, Hawkbit combines the artifact storage, the device registry, and the update state machine into one bundle. Try to debundle this. Yeah. Good luck. Doesn't work. So what you need is a core module that just does firmware update state machinery and this right. And this you may combine then with, for example, a device registry, which you may already have if you have some form of, of control or knowledge of your devices in the field. Um, yeah, so it's about modularity yeah. and composability. And this is what you may not really find, I feel. Okay. I, I think the device registry part is 
often integrate in some sort of project specific backend anyway? Yes, you need you, you need adapters. You need something that is flexible enough to talk to whatever database you have there by means of an adapter because you cannot dictate the schema for example they have to use you have to this is a brownfield scenario you have to adapt um, and composing all the stuff to form a greater good this is the the module thing and the yeah. big problem ripping apart stuff um, doesn't really work on long term yeah, so, so for the update server part i was thinking more about if we build the device registry and application side anyway, yep. having a nice composable interface on the update server, which just handles updating, exactly. would be more useful than an update server which knows how to talk to different registries or something. Exactly, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So updating is, is one of the parts. The other part is probably something to to set up the tunnels to the device over MQTT, over WebSockets, or whatever. So does anyone know of a yeah, component or project, or may maybe just some internal development that could be open sourced and uh, further uh, developed together in, in that area? Uh, maybe another topic, but uh, good experience with uh, InfluxDB and Grafana to show data and uh, also MQTT to send all the stuff to the server. Yes, yeah, so, so um, I, I think the, the uh, Grafana and InfluxDB side, it's, it's mostly for the uh, monitoring and telemetric stuff. So you push there and have a dashboard or can aggregate data. So that's, there are standard interfaces for that. So I don't think we need to reinvent that, uh, but it should work together with something like that. So the um, Balina thing has a very good terminal integration, or at least has had, haven't looked into this for, for two years, I guess. Um, I think they built it on WebSockets so that you have direct terminal access from a web page to your device. Mm -hmm. um, this was uh, has worked very well. So we, we did not make products with it, but I played with it and this was really nice. So Wh what was the name? Valina. Ah, okay. Yeah, this worked well. So it's a WebSocket, remote terminal via WebSocket authentication. Don't know if they hooked up PAM or something, but um, you have to log in, authenticate. Um, this worked well. Okay. It also works well, it's WireGuards, because it basically is bidirectional for free. Um, and you can, uh, on, on the device, make sure that all your connections go through the WireGuard to avoid, I mean, to, to avoid having, like, uh, somebody on the LAN accessing this, um, a service yeah. on the device. Yeah, we've seen different use cases where we decided against using WireGuard, because at that point you you have a lot of changes to your uh, routing setup and on the device. So maybe you don't want to have all of the devices have full IP connectivity to somewhere in your backend, because that's also more complex to secure on the backend side. So having just client certificate authenticated TLS sockets, like for web sockets, seems to be more easily securable. But yeah, it depends on the use case. Yeah, but you, you most likely you will want to have different ingress channels for different services in the backend anyway. So you have some kind of an of an API gateway, and this routes you to particular services in the backend. So I I still do see those as verticals, which you have to pick and choose from existing open source projects or make new ones for which they are missing and then do the integration and then it is all about modularity and composing stuff. Um. Yeah, of course, but I don't know of an uh, open source yeah, t tunnel broker thing that, that would maybe integrate with an API server. So then as far as I could, could find, there's nothing out there. So I'm, I'm trying to identify the components which might be integrated or are maybe missing. Uh, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, Mender again, uh, 
We do uh, web sockets, for example, with uh, devices, and uh, but uh, uh, getting back to the generic discussion of uh, like finding components that you can reuse. Our experience was uh, yeah semi the same. So we first started with uh, maybe looking into what's the out there that uh, we can reuse, but uh, a lot of those, lot of those things are too intertangled uh, somehow so that you can split it because. Uh, in order to have a fleet management, uh, you need to have a uh, like device connectivity with the server, and you need to authenticate this device. So uh, it's hard to find different components that will be responsible for uh, for different things. And then th this is a little bit sometimes too granular to to do because you need to get the data, you need to exchange the data. So our uh, uh, our backend is. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, so you need to have a gateway at some point, and then you have uh, microservices. This is how we do backend development nowadays. So you have a modules that you can replace. But uh, for those uh, like individual things, uh, our experience at least was that uh, yeah, it was or we are obviously reusing some things. Like uh, we have a WebSocket implementation. Yeah, we didn't like invent WebSockets. It's out there, but you still need to. Uh, like embed this into your product yep. to to have this stuff working, and then uh, yeah, I I agree again. Like uh, if you want to have a uh, different components, then the focus is somewhere else. So like uh, you need to create those interoperability layers. So maybe some protocols. How you define the data so that uh, different components can reuse the data. How you how you do this stuff. So th there are some initiatives, like uh, I'm not sure if you guys heard about uh, Open Industry Alliance. Uh, so they are mm -hmm. trying uh -huh. to create some kind of uh, standard for uh, how different uh, are no layers of communication can talk to each other. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's still pretty early, I think, and it will take time to create those uh, layers, basically. So uh, our experience was uh, that uh, it was extremely hard to find something that was already there that you can take, reuse, integrate, and it's working. Maybe adding to this, um, this is not the most sexiest thing to do, yeah? writing a fleet management backend. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's <laughs> infrastructure. So Exactly. Yeah. Um, you will find anything else, but not this. So. Uh, I look for this as well, for at least for parts, not for all of this, um, because we do have some solutions inside Demons, yeah, so no need for this. Um, still looked into parts. Um, I can totally agree you don't find this. Even then, if you find some building blocks, you need to integrate them in a particular way, which means you now build a product that you can run on the cloud having fleet management features. Now what do you do? Do you sell it as a product? Do you maintain it? Who does work on this? Because we have all those other options. The question of operations comes into play. Even if you can download the stuff fully fledged, you have to operate it, which means you pay someone yeah. or you have it in-house. So it's, I, I think the, the operation perspective or the operation part is underrated. Even if you have this, try to to operate Hawkbit. That's not that easy, right? Um, so, having the stuff available is point one, of course, requisite. But operating it is as hard as getting yeah. things but done in the first place. But still, in in some projects, it's it's critical to be a, at least that there is the option to run it yourself. Definitely. Sometime down the line, when the provider goes away. Definitely, and then it may help, as, as already said, um, if you have the specs. So if the specs are open and you're able to reproduce the backend in case it vanishes or somehow gets cancelled, whatever, um, then step in and do the work. So open specification is the least thing you need to take a product or some, some solution into consideration. So, so you would say it, it is enough to, to not have the backend open, but just the specs and implement it on the demand? No, it's, it's not enough, but okay. this is the least thing uh, under which condition you should consider at all going with this solution, having the specification open. 
So having a full yeah. black box product, um, no, no way. Yeah. This is the, the, the minimum bar you have to take. Okay, I agree. Uh, I would say actually that the um, device management is definitely the priority. That really needs to be open source. Fleet management is always going to be fairly custom. So the even commercial fleet management, in which is not uh, open source, is going to be um, very much service oriented. Um, so because of that, well, on the one hand, it makes it uh, much easier to make that open source because your income is anyway going to come from the service and not from the, the product. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, it's also less important to make it over open source because you can, uh, I mean, because it's so much custom, it's anyway possible or uh, doable to m migrate, I would expect. I'll just add, I, I don't think that it's the minimum to have the specification because for two reasons. One of them, I, I currently have a use case where, yeah, the requirement is to have this in the industrial network without any access. So the, the ability to have and run the entire thing on premise is, is really an, even an entry point. So for some cases, you really do need to have it. And, and even if you don't have that, I would still not feel comfortable running anything like this where I only have the specification because what if they, from one day to another, switch off my service? How long would it take to take, go from a specification? So I would still not even dare to go into that without an open uh, something where I have even tried. Uh, I've tried working with, uh, just for experiments with Berliner and the idea was there that if they decide to switch it off, at least I'll have open Berliner. You need to have something like that. You need It might not be the same, but you need to have some kind of reference implementation where you don't lose contact with your devices just overnight. So Yeah, yeah. we agree. So it's not about it takes time to get to the same point again. It's not a drop-in replacement, but, but okay. at least you have the chance yeah. to revive it again. Yes. So I do fully agree. I just I wonder, did, did anyone take a look into Open Berliner? Because maybe there were some things we could take there. I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mm. not saying that we should just consider Open Berliner as the thing, because there are definitely concerns. And uh, I've, I have not investigated it myself, the, late, uh, the latest period. But I've heard from someone that is working on it that it seems like they are kind of scaling down on mm -hmm. the Open Berliner part, and so for that, maybe it's time just, if it's good, I don't know, but if it's good, maybe we could take it and just carry it forward. Yeah. Um, so we only have three minutes left, uh, if I got that right. So um, we could maybe start an ILC channel to keep in contact for people who uh, are still interested in keeping this discussion running. <coughs> so if, would there be interest in something like that? To, yeah, so if anybody finds interesting new projects and uh, or starts taking over Open Berliner or whatever <laughs> to, to keep the others in, in, in the loop. So, yeah, it seems like that. So I'm going to create a uh, Libra chat channel bridge to Matrix that seems to be able to, to yeah, collect enough people. So, yeah, any suggestions about the name or just call it... Uh, Device management hash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I uh, know. <laughs> MG MT, MGMT. <laughs> yeah. So uh, nobody goes first. Uh, so I. Uh, <laughs> So I, I'll uh, add that and add a matrix bridge to that, and then add, I'll add that to the uh, document so so you can find it. So and, so and yeah, if anybody finds interesting or starts interesting open source projects uh, or is already working on some, please keep us in the loop. Because yeah, as infrastructure, it's, it's not uh, glamorous, but it still needs to be done. So. Uh, we should at least share the work. 
Okay, thank you for attending. This was very interesting. Thank you.